Good afternoon, colleagues, friends, guests. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapoku, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Janine Tessima Mola. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Mola. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers in our university. Inaugural lectures are an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her friends, family, mentors, and colleagues. As I acknowledge Professor Mola's presence with us today and the great honor of the university to get an opportunity to listen to his inaugural lecture, I would also like to acknowledge the following guests. Members of the executive management, members of Senate, family and friends of Professor Muller, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, and distinguished guests who are with us today from different parts of the world. At this stage, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean and Head of School, Professor Ross Robinson, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Janine Tasma Mola. Thank you, Professor Modi, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Colleagues, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you uh, Professor Ganene Mola. Professor Mola obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees from the University of Addis Ababa 
Uh, he then obtained his doctoral degree from the University of Bonn in Germany in 2003. Professor Moller has interacted with many institutions over the years, which include the University of Addis Ababa, the University of Bonn, the University of Alamea in, in Ethiopia, and more recently uh, at the National University of Lesotho. In 2011, Professor Moller joined the University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, in the School of Chemistry and Physics based on the Peter Maritzburg campus at the level of Associate Professor. Professor Moller's research is in the area of experimental condensed matter physics, and his current areas of interest are focused on nanostructured energy materials and thin film solar cell technologies. Over the years, Professor Moller has graduated a number of postgraduate students, uh, 41 in total, with 11 being at the level of doctorate. Professor Moller has published 125 research articles in very reputable journals, and he has currently got a NRF C2 rating. Professor Moller, as we've seen, is a leading researcher with many research outputs and has been rated in the top, top 30 research uh, publishers at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in 2019 and in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Ganene Moller this afternoon to deliver his inaugural lecture. Professor Moller. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Mori and Professor Robinson for the introduction. Um, I start sharing my screen. Um, with the screen, can you see the screen? We can, you may proceed. Okay. <clears throat> Um, uh, thank you, uh, colleagues and um, uh, uh, student and um, uh, collaborators in all of our um, uh, who is attending this this inaugural speech. Uh, thank you for um, uh, making for making it possible for uh, for this um, uh, venue. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm, I'm talking about um, some of my work. Uh, that I have done over the years and um, uh, some of the topics that I'm currently engaged with. Uh, at the moment, the, um, uh, the topic of my talk is about thin film for polymer solar cell as an alternative renewable energy sources. And then I would like to talk about uh, the progress I made um, in terms of uh, uh, improving the uh, power conversion efficiency and um, and many others. Um, <clears throat> I, my my talk um, includes some introduction and about um, uh, the the, field, the area of the field, um, uh, and then also I introduce some some of the materials that I use to um, uh, to produce solar cell, which I am studying for uh, past few years. Um, and then I will uh, make some kind, some some sort of conclusion, and then acknowledgments. Um, to begin with um, my uh, my presentation, I would like to um, um, I would like to 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 ask questions about why polymers are important in in photonic research. Uh, photonic research is basically a research um, field which deals with the uh, um, devices that interacts with um, uh, with light in order to function for um, certain uh, particular purposes. Like solar cell uh, is also one of the uh, device photonic device that interacts with light uh, to generate electricity for uh, human uh, use. Um, I use material like coal polymers, which is commonly used in on a daily basis on, on, a, on everyone household. For example, the polymers are organic <coughs> molecules, which has which basically has a large molecular weight and flexible mechanical properties. Um, polymers uh, traditionally are used uh, um, are known for their um, insulating property, electrically and uh, 
uh, for electricity and heat. However, there are class of polymers which can um, conduct electricity and, and by uh, in a certain way. And this class of polymer, basically called conjugated polymers, which constitute uh, alternating double and single bond. As an example, you can see here um, <clears throat> the polytiophene, per poly perol and polytiophene and polyacetylene and so on. So this class of polymers, they, <clears throat> they don't conduct electricity when they are in the neutral state, but they do, they do need to be um, doped or somehow in order to be able to conduct electricity. So, um, Okay. Okay. Now, uh, how uh, this is about the discovery of uh, uh, conducting polymers. Now, um, as I indicated earlier, polymers are known for uh, their uh, insulating property with, for electricity and heat. But uh, the the discovery of can electrical conduction on polymers is basically uh, comes by accident when uh, a researcher by the name of Shira, uh, Shirakawa in the University of Tsukuba in Japan, when he accidentally mixed the, the polyacetylene with iodine. And then suddenly he found that the conductivity rose by a uh, huge factor, which is in this case in the order of 10 raised to 5. Um, later on, he introduced this um, behavior of a polyacetylene when it is exposed to um, uh, uh, some uh, halogen molecules. And then the researchers continued to work with, uh, with um, Shirakawa and then from the University of California and Pennsylvania. And later on, they, um, laid, they laid the foundation for the potential application of polymers in optoelectronic devices. So these three, three, three researchers later on, they received a Nobel Prize in 2000, in 2000 for chemistry for the discovery and development of electrically conducting polymers. Now today, <clears throat> polymers have a wide range of applications. For example, you have lithium ion batteries, which can be, <coughs> polymers can serve as an electrode or some coating um, protect, coating uh, to protect some or corrosions and so for, from the electrolytes. And it can also be used as um, uh, bulk heterogeneous solar cell which generate electricity. And it can also be used um, as a thin film solar cell and light emitting diodes. So they, <clears throat> these are basically a, a huge um, uh, um, uh, a huge investment in, in terms of um, uh, economic interest. For example, the lithium ion battery, which is in the order of 900 million in, in, the, in the market price at the moment, namely two years, three years ago, and uh, the uh, lithium light emitting diode is in the order of now 300 billion um, expected to grow by 2025. The thin film transistor, which can serve for um, uh, as a base or a component of electronic devices for many, uh, many uh, uh, electronics like sensors and others. And it is currently sitting at about 200 billion in the market value. <clears throat> Now, having said that, the, how the, uh, the, the importance of uh, uh, electrical conducting polymers, and then uh, we, I'd like to introduce to you that <clears throat> how polymers conduct electricity. Um, electrical conduction is basically uh, for polymers um, dependent on the concentration of pre-charged carriers in, in the material, like uh, the electrons and holes, and also the mobility, which is defined um, basically by this relation. But some uh, researcher in by, um, Kaiser Italy he reported um, a series of measurement of the uh, conductivity of different materials compared to with the uh, conducting polymers. So of course, conducting polymers are, <coughs> um, are conductive when, when they are doped with some, uh, uh, some impurities. 
Now, as you can see here, the conductivity of the polyacetylene uh, um, basically com is comparable with many other metals at room temperature by doping the polyacetylene with some uh, impurities. Now, <clears throat> how do we dop the, uh, uh, the polyacetylene or what is the, the mechanism for electrical conduction uh, uh, in polymers? I use polyacetylene as an example, where in this case, uh, the mechanism for electrical conduction is, is basically the, um, comes from the imperfection of the polymers. So imperfections um, in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the molecular arrangement or the bonding of molecules in the, in the polyacetylene leads to the um, uh, defects, which that defect can can migrate along the polymer chain for a certain distance. Therefore, for example, if you look at polyacetylene it has phase one and phase two during the, uh, the process of polymerization, this these two phases can meet into, at, in, in, a, in such a way that there is a disruption of, of the alternating uh, single double bond. So this <clears throat> uh, defect is basically known as solitone which can travel to four to five monomer units, which makes possible the electrical conduction on the polymer backbone. The other possibility is a polaron. Polaron is also <clears throat> generated by in the process of polymerization where the, uh, the, uh, the ions removes <coughs> the uh, electrons or add electrons to polymer chain where the, <coughs> the cations remains in the polymer where it attracts the, uh, the, the anion uh, in such a way that it will migrate into uh, on a polymer chain for some distance. So these two <clears throat> kind of approach or imperfection on the polymer backbone is basically the source of electrical conduction. And in terms of uh, energy band structure, where you have um, two atoms joining to form a molecule, they are, there is a possibility of bonding and that in bonding state, where these states um, is basically combined when you form a large molecular um, uh, uh, aggregation uh, to form a bulk property or bulk uh, material which is basically uh, um, turns into uh, LUMO and HUMO, which is low, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital or the highest occupied molecular orbitals, which is equivalent to the so-called um, uh, balance band and conduction band in an organic um, uh, uh, semiconductors like silicon and, uh, and many others. However, in the uh, persistent state or in the neutral state, the homolum, uh, the, there is no state in between, between LUMO and HUMO when the, the, the polymer backbone is, not, is free of defects. When the defect is uh, produced, then there is an intermediate state, which is basically called soliton, which I showed you earlier. Whereas this soliton, if you create more and more defect in the polymer backbones, then it creates a so-called large soliton band, where this soliton band is basically becomes a transition from uh, electron transition from, from the HUMO level to LUMO level where the electric conduction is possible. So the transition from here to here and from here to here is possible that, till, that basically facilitate the electrical conduction. Now, uh, apart from increasing the electrical conduction, the, uh, the, the, apart from, sorry. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, apart from the electrical conduction behavior, and then here is the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the optical absorption also is in increased by a certain factor. For example, the, uh, because of the various 
<coughs> polymer links in in the chain, the uh, Lumo and Humo label is not as as it as, as it looks before, but it is consists of several extended states where this state <laughs> allows the transition from Humo to Lumo label, where the uh, uh, electrons can uh, jump from the Humo label to uh, from Humo label to Lumo label, where um, to, to conduct electricity. Where in that sense, then those uh, electrons coming from the um, from the surface or from the uh, edge of the, the humo label and the deep side of the uh, the the humo label basically uh, constitutes a large um, absorption range, which is basically how wide the um, absorption band of the polymer is. Wide, uh, widely extended, for example, for this polymer, it is ranging from uh, 450 up to 780. So many others do have also similar uh, properties. Now, <clears throat> um, sorry, um, um, now um, what is organic uh, solar cell? So organic solar cell, like any other solar cell, is a solar cell that converts solar energy into electricity. It's expected to be cheap and lightweight and flexible. And it is also a portable uh, solar panel that basically used at, um, in, uh, in, in a daily basis. But uh, tin film solar cell basically uh, is composed of several layers of materials. That means, for example, in a laboratory uh, scale, we use ITO coated indium tin oxide coated glass and with a whole transport layer, uh, active layer, which constitutes the polymers, and electron transport layer and aluminum. Of all these <clears throat> layers, uh, the active layer is the, the main factor that, um, uh, or the main medium where the electrical conduction, um, I mean, the uh, electrical uh, solar energy conversion is possible. So the uh, tin film organic solar cell are a conventional and unconventional type of solar cell, which can be painted on a glass windows. It can be um, uh, uh, printed on a flexible substrate where you can generate electricity like this one. Even it can be uh, um, painted on a bag of different size and shapes. So this is very uh, lightweight and um, uh, uh, easy to use uh, solar cell as a technology. Okay, <clears throat> now, having said that, the, um, uh, the active layer of the solar cell uh, basically can, is composed of various combination of materials. For example, it can be composed of from polymer to full polymer and fullerene, which is um, a ball shaped like structure of, of uh, C60. And you have polymer, polymer blend, and you have also polymer inorganic. Um, blend. So that constitutes basically the uh, solar absorber layer or the active layer of the material, which is the critical component of the device. Where in this composition basically can be printed, it can be formed like a solution. It is solution processable and then it can, the, just a small ink can be printed on a large area. So this is um, the advantage of uh, thin film organic solar cell. This is this is this is a typical solar cell that you can find uh, and to um, to mount it in any surface and any flexible surface. In the laboratory scale, we basically use it, so the techniques called um, uh, spin coating, where you, we use a glass substrate uh, to coat the um, the uh, polymer ink on on a surface. So uh, um, this is how we produce the um, process the solar cell at the laboratory stage. So the materials that we use often in, in producing the, um, the solar cells are basically the, the acceptor and donor molecules. Um, these acceptor donor molecules are most often, most cases are um, commercially available or can be synthesized by chemist collaborators and also used um, in, in, in various form. And so generally based on the use of acceptor molecules, the, um, the thin film solar, organic solar cell can be 
classified into two main groups. So it means fullerene-based and the other one is non-fullerene-based. So the fullerene-based um, uh, um, uh, solar cell basically uses C60 as the main component of the uh, acceptor molecules where some branches are used just for um, uh, to make it soluble in a, in a common solvent. However, the C60 is one of the components that makes fullerene as, as an acceptor. And the other one is, is non-fullerene, which can be designed in many ways, but um, uh, still um, uh, is more effective than the fullerene ones, because this one is, the fullerenes are basically, uh, has a limited chance of uh, tuning the energy band gap structure. So that's why the power conversion efficiency is still lower than 30%. So the non-fullerene one is currently um, uh, sitting about 20% power conversion efficiency, which is um, close to even uh, higher than uh, silicon-based solar cell. Uh, this is another material, donor molecules, which are used in, with uh, fullerene-based solar cell. And these are in the kind of donor molecules which are used as um, as, a, as a donor in uh, a non fullerene paid source cell. So and the mechanism of um, uh, uh, solar energy conversion, solar energy conversion in tin film organic solar cell follows uh, the following uh, uh, method. The first one is basically when light comes in into, um, into, a, into a solar cell, uh, then it, the ideal coated glass is almost transparent and then it passes through the active layer where the polymer planes are sitting. But these polymer planes basically um, need to form a certain uh, um, phase separation domains where you have, for example, the, um, the brownish one is maybe the donor and then the blue, the blue one is basically the acceptor domain. So when light enters into this region, what happened is the, the exciton, the quasi-particle is generated, where these excitons are uh, positive and negative charge, which can, which basically might, which are coupled by the electrostatic uh, Coulomb attraction, where this uh, quasi-particle migrate toward this interface between donor and, donor and acceptor molecules, where they separated into a free electron and holes. So the holes are basically, which is a positive charge, which uh, basically uh, um, uh, transported along the, the, the donor domain, whereas the electrons are uh, transported along the, um, uh, the acceptor domain to the electrodes. So this is one of the, this is a basic mechanism of, um, of, of solar energy conversion um, by using um, bulk heterojunction uh, tin film organic solar cells. Now, the factors that are, uh, the factors that are uh, affecting the, um, the performance of organic solar cells are the major ones at least are the optical absorption widths. Uh, and the metal semiconductor interfaces and um, the film morphology, which can be controlled by thermal annealing and the nature of post solvent and also using solvent additives. So charge transport was also a process that needs to be um, uh, well understood in order to be able to have a very effective mechanism of collecting charges from the, uh, uh, from the area of creations. When light comes in, where the donors and acceptor molecules are blended with the, in, <clears throat> the energy between the humos of the, uh, the, the donor and the, the work function of the anode, which is in this case is the uh, indium tin oxide, need to be synchronized in such a way that holes can be easily collected. And the same is true where with the acceptor and the, and the cathode. Um, in, in the case of the optical uh, absorptions, um, as you can see here in this figure, the optical absorptions are um, uh, basically the emission of radiation from the sun is a very wide range of uh, spectrum. But uh, um, the material that we are using only uh, absorbs light 
from a certain um, region of interest. I mean, basically, we don't have an ideal material that absorbs all the emission of radiation uh, from, uh, from solar. However, there are mechanisms or ways and meters where we can adverse as much as possible from the emission of radiation by combining different molecules of, uh, of acceptor and donor molecules uh, together. And also by <laughs> designing different types of uh, um, uh, arch architectural design, uh, device architectural design, which um, favors more absorption uh, within the photoactive layers. Um, for example, you have um, uh, piece RHT, which is one of the most common known uh, um, uh, polymer, uh, donor polymer, uh, which can only absorb a certain section of the, the, the um, the, the emission of radiation, whereas the, the PCBM, which is um, the acceptor, in this case is almost um, uh, um, accept very little from solar emission or, because majority of the absorption in uh, PCBM is on the uh, ultraviolet regions. Well, that's why the uh, many other acceptors, which is in the non-fluorine based acceptors like uh, Y6 is now is, uh, is more favorable in the, um, uh, in the preparation of organic uh, solar cells. Um, not only the limitation of optical absorption band, even when you, <coughs> when we mix the uh, piece rigidity, for example, with PCBM, the intensity of absorption reduces because of the um, uh, disorder uh, that, um, that is created by the presence of PCBM next to the piece rigidity uh, matrix. So interfaces are also another uh, component of um, uh, the the, uh, the critical component of the solution uh, in the electronic devices, where the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the charges uh, uh, from metal to semiconductors are basically um, uh, uh, need to be smooth enough so that it will. Um, collect all the generated charges from semiconductor to metal. So metals are usually used as an electrode and, uh, and to collect the charges that were generated by semiconductors. But there are so many phenomena that takes place by, uh, um, uh, by making the contact between metal and semiconductors. In this case, our semiconductors is uh, conducting polymers where um, in the, at the interface there is <clears throat> uh, many other many possibilities, including um, the concentration of charges and also the, the so-called image forces by uh, uh, by the presence of or of electrons in the uh, semiconductor medium. So this semiconductor medium emitted um, um, the electrons emitted from metal to semiconductor medium, for example, uh, generate a field which basically affects the, the charge distribution in the meta. So all these uh, factors need to be uh, carefully um, uh, attended in order to be able to have a more effective um, um, collection of charges. So uh, similarly, like I said earlier, we have um, uh, accepted donor molecules where the interdependent structure of the accepted and donor with respect to the anode and the cathode uh, has to be um, uh, tuned in, in such a way that the uh, charge transfer from the, the, the polymer to the cathodes uh, um, should be as smooth as possible. Now, what, what have we done in order to improve this kind of challenges uh, in terms of optical absorption and transport process? What we have done here is basically to, we use metal nanoparticles in order to improve optical absorption and also to improve the charge transport processes. Um, metal uh, 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 nanoparticles, basically do not, uh, uh, not only applies in the energy sector, but it can also serve in many, many other uh, disciplines today. So uh, uh, I'm using the, the 
um, um, were exploiting the, the, the behavior of the metal nanoparticles um, to, can, to assist us to improve this solar energy har uh, harvesting. Now, when, <clears throat> what happened when, uh, um, when light interacts with the nano Particles. So you know, basically, the nanoparticles are sitting in uh, in one of the um, the, uh, the functional layers of the solar cell. When light comes in, basically, for probably for many of you, when light is composed of electric and magnetic field, where the electric and the magnetic field um, uh, oscillate back and forth. I mean, um, uh, in a different ways in order to be able to um, my, um, you know to um, travel at the speed of light um, however now when light interacts with metal nanoparticles well nano metal nanoparticles do have a large <laughs> concentration of surface charge so the electric field component of the light basically um, polarizes the charge one uh, on the surface of the metal, where the, the surface of the metal um, uh, pushes or attracts the, um, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the electron charge are basically attracted by the field and so that the, there will be a displacement of charges from compared to the, the positive um, uh, nucleus of the, the, the metal particles. Uh, the, the, this displacement of charge basically induces uh, uh, dipole moment, where the dipole moment oscillate uh, according to the direction of the electric field of the light. So this oscillation of the dipole uh, um, carries with certain frequencies when the frequency of oscillation of the dipole coincides with the, the frequency of the light, then resonance occurs. That means takes a kind of absorption uh, uh, energy takes place. So this is a phenomenon that we uh, exploited in order to improve uh, solar uh, energy harvesting using uh, Timpion solar cells. Um, <clears throat> basically, the metal nanoparticles comes with different shape and sizes. So the, the reaction of the, this metal nanoparticles also uh, differ depending on the size and the shapes. For example, we have here um, metal nanoparticles, gold metal nanoparticles. Uh, in this case, you have um, a road-like structure. Uh, for example, you have 750 nanometer lengths and 800 nanometer lengths and 913 nanometer lengths. However, when light interacts with these nano roads, there are two phenomena happens. That is, the first one is the, uh, the, uh, the transverse surface plasma resonance, and the other one is longitudinal surface plasma resonance. This resonance is the transverse is when the electric field component of the um, uh, the light um, uh, basically perpendicular to the uh, the dipole moment uh, of the uh, the charges on the surface of the uh, the metal, whereas when the field is parallel to the to the dipole moment of the metal, then that's so called uh, longitudinal surface plasma resonance. So depending on now the sizes, the resonance absorption of the, the nano, the absorption of the, um, the, the particle basically changes. As the size increases, basically the um, absorption uh, moves to the infrared regions, which is basically um, uh, good because most of the uh, emission of radiation from the sun uh, sitting uh, between uh, 600 to about 1,100 nanometer <clears throat> lengths. Now, uh, this dependence of the, um, uh, the resonance absorption is basically um, um, confirmed by theoretical calculation using um, a classical theory of light scattering by my and guns. 
then the size and the intensity of the uh, light scattering, um, uh, light uh, surface plasma resonance absorption basically uh, uh, depends on, uh, on the um, aspect ratio, which determines the size uh, of the, um, uh, the nanoparticles. So the bigger size of the nanoparticle basically um, uh, induces long range um, uh, absorption possible, and also the intensity of the absorption grows higher. Now, <clears throat> where do we use these nanoparticles in, in the polymer solar cell? We can use the solar the uh, um, uh, the nanoparticles at the various layers of the uh, nanostructure. Where, for example, in the active layer, we can use them in uh, in hole transport layer or in electron transport layer. And um, the once they um, they are in, there are several phenomena can happen which collectively uh, basically um, uh, contribute to the uh, um, to the enhancement of um, optical absorption and also the charge transport processes because um, when the incident light interacts with um, with the nanoparticles then extension of uh, uh, LCPR occurs where it can it can uh, possibly scatter lights within the medium in, within the active medium, or we can the scattering can happen also in in the hole um, transport layer or electron transport layer, or it can generate a strong field um, that uh, in the surrounding medium where um, ex exciton dissociation can be assisted in order to um, uh, in order to separate the charges into uh, free charge carriers <clears throat> and also absorption and so is also possible. So um, from all this uh, um, uh, um, plasmonic uh, properties, we uh, have um, exploited the, the number of, number of uh, um, uh, uh, factors. For example, we have, um, yeah, as an example, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you just a few examples of what we have done. So we have done some uh, uh, preparation of nanoparticles of something like core shell structure of silver and copper. So this, the, uh, the silver is coated with uh, copper, which you basically, which can clearly seen in here. But um, the dimension of the, the core shell structure varies from um, uh, from um, point to um, from point to point, where where you have um, uh, the largest <laughs> the largest nanoparticles here is over over, over 102 nanometer, where the smallest one is 21 nanometer. This is of course is an advantage for um, uh, energy harvesting, where the lights <laughs> in in the active layer uh, can scatter lights and then um, uh, and then increases the, the um, the length of the path length of the, the light within the medium through which more uh, charge free charge carriers can be harvested. So using this nanoparticle in the active layer of uh, polymers like con 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 containing PCH and PCB and blend, uh, we were able to increase the, the uh, power conversion efficiency from 3.3 .3 to 4.7. Well, this is not um, uh, um, it's not small, but uh, given the fact that this 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 polymer um, or this solar cell are produced in a laboratory in ambient laboratory conditions, where um, uh, the increase in power conversion efficiency is a very uh, um, uh, um, positive impact on um, the performance of the thin film organic solar cell. And the other um, material that we, we, we used is copper um, uh, dot lanthanum phosphate, where in this case, we have a floor-like structure, which is very important for the uh, scattering process in, um, in the uh, photoactive medium. 
So we use this material in the photoactive medium to be able to increase the scattering process where um, and the more lights can remain in the active layer. As I indicated earlier, the active layer is very thin. So most of the light basically left unnoticed because of the, the thickness of the layer. But once we have we put the, um, the copper double antenna phosphate, and then we found that more light can be captured by the active layer. As you can see here, um, if you look if you look at the um, um, the um, uh, the optical absorption of the film of con containing p 3 pcbm you can see the presence of um, uh, the metal nanoparticles around this region and this region, which basically um, improves the solar uh, optical absorption compared to uh, undoped uh, um, active layer. So be because of that, the um, there is a surge of photo current in, from this device. Even if we use the same um, uh, uh, PCBM uh, active layer and the power conversion efficiency now grows from 3% to 6%, which is um, pretty much uh, um, uh, uh, very good result compared to the nature of uh, the, uh, the two molecules. So um, with, with this in mind, we continue to investigate uh, the property of these um, different uh, nanoparticles uh, for different um, photoactive medium. Uh, <clears throat> the other one which we, we, uh, which we have uh, used at the moment is um, zinc oxide, um, uh, silver dot zinc oxide nanoparticle. So in which where we, we use this nanoparticle into the whole transport layer where um, the, uh, um, the, there is a significant um, um, uh, light scattering can take place. Uh, uh, however, if you look at the, um, the uh, TEM images of the, um, the, the nanoparticles, then the zinc oxide has different lengths and shapes. And this is also, of course, um, an advantage, an advantage where, where you can exploit the, the, the various possibilities of, um, um, of harvesting solar energy uh, into, into the active layer. So more scattering takes place within the, um, the whole transport layer, and then the more light remains in the active layer which means generate more photocurrent that can be collected by um, uh, electrons and, and, and holes um, uh, by the electrodes and, uh, and uh, the anodes, and then that can be expo exported into um, external load. So we use in this case, the um, uh, non-fluorine acceptor here is IT, ICTH and the PTB7, which is a different um, uh, types of polymers. This is an, this is an acceptor, uh, that means non fluorine acceptor, and this is, um, uh, is a, a polymer, a donor polymer. And uh, with this in mind, we, we can see that uh, we have um, changes. We have seen changes in power conversion efficiency and also the collection of water current due to the presence of um, uh, silver dope zinc oxide in the whole transport layer where the extended quantum efficiency, uh, which is the, the parameters that uh, measures the amount of uh, uh, photo-generated current uh, collected by the, um, uh, the presence of or by the incident photons uh, is basically improved by 5%. Of course, it looks smaller, but it is at least uh, makes changes in the performance of the solar cell. So there is the uh, evidently there is a change in the um, optical absorption of the um, uh, the uh, this material in terms of changes um, due to the presence of uh, the nanoparticle in the in the transport layers. So um, if you look at the power conversion efficiency, the power conversion efficiency rate changes from 10.69 to 11.17. Uh, 
um, it is a certain gross, which is 10%, 11% of the power conversion efficiency for thin film or organic cellular cell is the, the required um, power conversion efficiency for mass production. So uh, it is a, is a good progress, and uh, but um, this uh, the nanoparticles here um, doesn't show significant um, changes on the um, collection of water current. Now uh, I'll take you to uh, the two various types of uh, thin film solar cell technologies. Now um, there are at least. Um, four types of emerging thin film solar cell technologies, one of which is organic solar cell, Dyson cell solar cell, organic tandem cell, and perovskite. Perovskite, which is <clears throat> basically um, uh, um, began wor working at around 10, 2009, but um, uh, the power conversion efficiency basically grows um, continuously. And at the moment, it is about 26%, which is also is a kind of material which is um, uh, produced in like um, in, the, in the case of organic solar cell with, from processing by solution. Um, the organic solar cell is also growing monotonically from uh, start, which started well in 2000. And then now it is uh, growing very close to um, uh, 20%, which is very um, important, which is 20% power conversion efficiency of organic solar cell uh, from fuller, non fullerene based uh, uh, acceptor molecules is a very important progress in, uh, in towards achieving um, more um, um, uh, you know, realistic um, uh, realization of the uh, um, uh, organic solar cell in an energy market. Now, the prospect of uh, thin film organic solar cell is, um, is very huge and basically it can be applied in many, um, uh, 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 in many ways. Um, one is it can be printed into um, uh, different um, uh, 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 surfaces and like I showed you earlier we have it can, it can be also printed on tint it can be printed on uh, on a glass windows and many other even sometimes it can be also printed um, on uh, sunglasses which basically can generate also electricity so it has a very high potential um, uh, in um, uh, in generating um, um, solar energy uh, uh, to electricity for different purposes. So I'm, um, I'm wondering that in the future, we may be able to carry our own solar cell within in our pocket where whenever we go or whatever uh, we are, we can just stretch the solar cell from uh, and then uh, generate electricity to charge our um, cell phone or our uh, um, 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 computers and so on. So in conclusion, uh, thin film organic solar cells have a potential to provide cheap and clean source of energy. And um, well, uh, plasma nanoparticles are also an effective mechanism to improve energy harvesting. And then the non the introduction of non in, in, in solar cell, in thin film organic solar cell, basically uh, drastically changes the power conversion efficiency um, and then make it compatible or comparable with uh, the inorganic solar cell, which is currently available in the market. So um, research efforts are still underway for improve many of the challenges, especially the, um, uh, uh, the challenge of improving the uh, um, uh, stability of the polymer molecules in ambient environment. So uh, <clears throat> some of the, the um, successes that we have here is about 32 postgraduate students have completed in the past um, few years, and over 
uh, research articles are produced. And so uh, we have introduced uh, photonic research in our institution and international uh, and, and local collaborations have been uh, established. <clears throat> So acknowledgement, uh, uh, acknowledgement, research, National Research Foundation for various research grants, University of Kosovo Natal uh, for research opportunities, or postgraduate students who have been part of our research activities, um, PhD, MSc honors, and uh, there are among others uh, the research collaborators, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Sharma and Kumar, uh, Shulan University, India, and Professor Yang. Uh, from China, um, uh, Professor Davis from Swansea University, England, and uh, Professor Sike from Akron, USA, and uh, uh, Professor Polikani from Messina, and also Professor um, uh, uh, Kasina Tan from the University of South Africa. So um, finally, I'm highly indebted to my family uh, for their patience, understanding uh, during my absence because of my work, to my wife, Yur Salim, and uh, my children, and I thank you all. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, you can put down your slides so you okay. can all be visible. Yes, uh, colleagues. I'm sure you will all agree with me that uh, this full professor is sharing with us um, a narrative that is topical. If you don't know what topical means, go to the dictionary. If you do not have a dictionary, go outside and uh, tell me after two hours what you experienced in South Africa today. Today, we need people who can put together their heads and share their experiences with others, just like Professor Mola has done. We are facing issues that require this kind of research to be shared with people who make decisions. I'd like to express my gratitude and confirm that uh, it was not a mistake that we brought you to UKZN and we are sure that you are continuing to do great work at UKZN together with people from outside of our university and all over the world, as you uh, indicated in your last slide. Um, it's amazing uh, that as you were presenting, I was uh, also checking uh, your sources and your areas of uh, publication. And one fascinating thing that I realized is mathematics, chemistry, and physics being together. <laughs> that was quite exciting. I mean, when I looked at the at, uh, 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 Physica, uh, one of the journals that you publish a lot in, it's got an impact factor of almost four and a site score of seven. This is what our university uh, would like to encourage. So I, would, uh, I believe that everybody who's watching you uh, will follow the example that you set. Uh, you are indebted to your family. We are indebted to your family more so than you do. And I would like to take this opportunity to also thank your collaborators and students. Um, and uh, the people who organized this meeting need to be applauded for the great job that they did to bring people together um, when the weather is fascinating. <laughs> Uh, for many to be outside uh, and sitting in front of uh, uh, the screens watching your, your presentation. We enjoyed it and we learned a lot from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Modi. Uh, 